is why does God correct us? A few, a couple years ago, I was in a preacher training program uh, in South Texas in the Lovkin area, and I had just preached a lesson from God's Word. And when, after I finished it, I felt that I was able to convey the message clearly. I felt that it was something that could be of great benefit to the brethren. I felt like it, it went very well. Afterwards, I had came to the front, and the preacher there came up to me to then critique me and give me some advice on how I may improve on preaching the sermon, on how to better put all my information together. And the first words he, says, he said to me was, I think it would be best if you just rewrote the entire thing. And that seemed pretty harsh. And it, it really sh- strikes you whenever you first hear that. But as he went on, as he talked about it, he said, Now, I know that sounds harsh, and I know that sounds very critical of you in the way that you preach the sermon, but I just want you to know that I said that, and I said those things for your benefit and for your growth. It's not to belittle you or anything like that. Over time, I've seen, in, in, in my personal opinion, we have it very easy, and we take it very easily whenever people correct us, and whenever we go back and forth between people, that you may come to me and give me some type of criticism, or I may come to you and give you some type of criticism. And there may be times where people butt heads a little bit, but overall, we are very understanding that, well, I, I, I get it, they're trying to help me out. However, whenever it becomes matters of God correcting us, and it's our own spiritual lives, well, all of a sudden we throw up our hands and we get very defensive. They're saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you to tell me the way I'm living my life? Where, where do you get this? How can you judge me off of where I am? And I've seen people, not only in the world, but even within, the, within being Christians, that will sometimes, whenever things go wrong, and maybe it is that, God is punishing or, or correcting that would say, well, God, why are you doing all this to me? Why are you throwing all this in my direction? Why are you just beating me down till I can't stand up? It's not fair, God. It's not right for you to treat me this way. Who are you to correct me? Why is it that you decide to correct me of all people? You begin to see how prideful that sounds. But we're going to go through that tonight and just bring that up. But first, let's see the notebooks. That is always awesome to see. Your three words tonight, I don't have them up here, but your first word is discipline. Discipline is something that is very important. It's something that has been hardly pressed throughout my entire life, but through the life of every Christian, it's hard pressed that we are to have the discipline to be different, to stand out from the world. The second word is for our benefit. Our benefit being that what is beneficial to us, what helps us to improve within life. We're going to talk about how God does everything expressly for our benefit. And the last word is maturity. Maturity being that we have gone from being a toddler into a, a, a young kid to a teen to an adult, but also in our spiritual life we grow the exact same way. We had Chris Emerson here a couple weeks ago. And he talked about the stages of growth with a Christian, that how you are to be increasing in maturity, and we're going to go through that as well. We first understand that the reason God corrects us is because He is a loving Father. He does care for us. He does want the best of us. He does want the best from us. Like we mentioned, He is one that disciplines us, that He teaches us. The word discipline actually means the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior using punishment to, create, to correct disobedience. Parents, whenever you are teaching your child, and yes, you do love them, but you don't just coddle them along and, and maybe kind of give them a little bit of nudge to say, okay, now you need to get this right, or hey, you slipped up. You, you don't do that. You give them expectations. In other words, you kind of lay down the law of this is how things are supposed to be. I was with some brethren not too long ago, and we were having a study through 1 Thessalonians. And 1 Thessalonians, he comes to the brethren, he actually speaks to the brethren and says that, I came to you from a position of love, as a loving mother, that I I nurtured you, I, I cared for you, I gave you everything you needed. 
But a few verses down, he says, But I also came to you as a father, a father laying down expectations of giving discipline and rule that this is where I expect you to be. This is the merit that I'm going to hold you to. And God does the exact same way. He loves us. He cares for us. He gives us everything we need. He nurtures us. But he also gives us discipline and expectations of the way we are supposed to live our lives and the way that we are meant to be. And we know that discipline is such a biblical principle because we can see so many examples throughout Proverbs. And we're just going to go through them very quickly. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 18 says, Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. In other words, saying, look, the child is going to be foolish at times, and so you may have to beat it out of him. You may have to show him what it means to be better, to improve, to be living the right way. We also have in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13, this is one of my dad's favorite verses. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. <laughs> Had a lot of experiences of that. But it is so beneficial. It is, it hurts in the moment. It, it definitely is painful in the moment for the child. But it's always for the better. It's always to help them understand that I can't be going down this road. Whenever I was younger, some of the other things that would happen, I got in trouble with school quite a bit, is having to go outside and, and work outside, pulling weeds all day till night, rake, raking leaves, whatever it was, but doing some type of hard labor. And I remember one of the things that he, my dad would always tell me is, if you're going to make these kind of decisions, I'm going to show you what kind of lifestyle that leads to. That because I wasn't taking care of my schoolwork, because I didn't care, because I wasn't doing the things that the teachers asked of me, it wasn't going to lead me anywhere that was good. It would lead somewhere where I'd end up at a dead-end job, not able to do anything, not able to move forward, and I'd be doing menial tasks that are exhausting and, and can be harmful for the body if you're not taking care of yourself, like pulling weeds all day. God does the exact same thing for us. Proverbs chapter 29, verses 15 and 17, The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Correct your son, and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. This verse even brings up the mother, that not only is the father one who is bringing down the discipline, the expectations, but it also shows the kind of hurt it causes your mother whenever you sin. I've had times in my life personally where I have stumbled and I have seen the kind of damage it can cause. I've seen tears in the faces of the ones I love because of, the wrong, because of my wrongdoings. And it's the exact same way with God. He is not just that Father that is disciplined, that is giving us expectations, that is bringing the rod down upon us. He is loving and nurturing. And whenever we are someone who goes against him, whenever I choose that my own ideals and my own beliefs are more important than what God has told me, I bring shame to him. I hurt him. I almost bring tears to his eyes because I won't listen. Discipline is something that is very biblical. But God takes no joy in punishing us. We have in verses like 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that talks about how he doesn't take any joy in it, how he does not care for it whatsoever, but he still has to do it. Go with me, if you will, to Exodus, excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 20. If you'll look with me in Ezekiel chapter 20, in verse 14, to give some context of what's been going on at this point. Whenever you go through all the prophets, it's message after message after message of people coming to Israel and coming to Judah and warning them of the way that they've been living their lives, telling them that if they don't stop, if they don't turn from where they are going, that destruction is going to come. You have specifically lamentations that it's so, it's so devastating to hear about what happens to the land, about how 
much destruction comes upon the land of Judah. And in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 14, it says, But I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles, in whose sight I had brought them out. God is specifically stating in that verse, I don't want to do this. You are my child and I love you. Jesus is going to mention this phrasing later in Matthew, but I wanted to bring you under my wing as, as, as a bird brings her, her babies under her wing for protection. I wanted to bring you in close. I love you. I care for you. But because you will not listen, I have to do this for my name's sake. I have to show that I, not specifically me, but God in the scripture is saying that my name is supposed to be held in reverence. I'm supposed to be respected. I'm supposed to be feared. Not fear of the, the destruction that he could cause, though yes, that is something that we are to be afraid of because of how powerful and awesome he is. But fear in that knowing who he is and how much he has done for us as well. He is to be feared, he is to be respected, he is to be revered. He's supposed to be held in the most high esteem. And he's saying that as much as it pains me to do this, I have to do it. Because I have to show to everyone what this means. How important it is to be in service to me, to be following me, instead of going on in our own direction. It is a place of love that he corrects us. And so whenever we have times, and, I, and I'm maybe just wondering, why can't I get things right? God, why are you treating me this way? Why is my life going the way that it is? Why are you correcting me so often? Why, why can't I just get things right? It's all from a place of love. And so just like how we talk about each other in that, Whenever a brother comes to correct you, he's, trying to, he's coming from a place of love to correct you. God is doing the exact same thing. Let's turn back over to Hebrews, if you will. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read the verses 5 through 8 once again. If you'll look with me, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. One of the great benefits of growing growing up is being able to look back on the lessons that your parents have taught you and even though in that specific moment you're just wow he just just really wore into me or, or, or she really wore into me and just just really beat me down I, I, I want nothing to do with her anymore once you get older you begin to look back at those instances and you really see and you see and understand it was from love there wasn't any kind of outbursts of anger or wrath and that it's just beating for no reason but everything has a point that I love you and because I love you I have to show you the right way and unfortunately that comes at at a cost God loves us and because he loves us he chastens us he wants us to be with him he wants us to have the discipline that we need but he also does it because he is a dedicated mentor. It's not only a position of, of a parent, which is one of the greatest things of all, but it, it is almost a, a role outside of being a parent as well that almost, almost like a profession that this is the way you're moving forward. You have grown up. You have become a, a young adult or an adult. You're starting your career. Now I'm going to show you the steps to be successful and moving forward. God does everything for our own benefit. Excuse me, I believe I pressed the wrong button there. He does everything for our benefit. If we look in the next few verses of Hebrews chapter 12, 
In Hebrews chapter 12, looking down at verse 9, beginning in verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 12. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Whenever it goes through those verses, it specifically mentions that the fathers did as they seemed best to them, but he for our profit, showing that God's rule and God's decisions and God's expectations and the way he chastens us, there is no fault within that. Whenever we go to our parents, and many of us could go to our parents and say, is there something that you wish you would have done differently? And I'm sure each and every one of them would tell you that, yes, I've made a mistake. I may have disciplined too quickly. I may have disciplined too late. I wish that I had taught you these things earlier, or I wish I would have enforced these lessons more throughout your life. For God, everything is perfect. Everything is expressly what we need in order to improve and in order to be successful. It is for our profit, our benefit, and our benefit alone. But it's for our benefit alone so that we could glorify and honor Him and have unity with Him. If you look also in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In 2 Peter 1, chapter 1, looking at verses 1 through 4, it says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious, precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So if we ever feel, and if I ever feel that I am lacking something, I have right here what I need to be successful. I have everything God has told me for my profit and for my benefit. The gospel that he has given us is the method in which God has mentored us and has helped us to move forward. We have Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. If you want to look at those verses with us, with me. And many of us could easily quote these verses, but I just want to read them once again. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So yes, there is salvation that comes, but everything you need in order to be a righteous man from the time that you have entered the waters of baptism to the day you die, everything that you need to be righteous in the sight of God is right here. Is everything that He has told us. It is without fault. It is without controversy. Everything we need. Look a few chapters further in chapter 3 and verse 21. Romans chapter 3 verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Whenever it's talking about that righteousness of God, it is not saying the righteousness of God alone, but rather the way in which to be righteous is right there. It can be found. Separate from the law, that showing that it's not just the, the law alone. We have so many times of, and examples of the, the Israelites in the Old Testament. They were given the law. They were given everything that they needed in order to be righteous. And yes, the law did show them the way in which to be righteous in the sight of God. But it wasn't just that alone that could save them. It wasn't that alone that could help them. It wasn't that alone which saved them. But we, being separate from the law, show that we have faith. And that faith is what helps us. And that faith is what mentors us. He tells us everything we need to grow. 
He never leaves us alone. No matter what stage of life I am in, no matter if it's the first year of being a Christian, no matter if it's being the 49th year, everything I need can be found. And there's always something new for him to show me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and looking in verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The point of that, you don't have to be some advanced scholar in order to understand what it is that God wants for you to do. We have so many people that become professors of theology that that spend their entire lives dedicated to looking at the academic research and going through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books and commentaries and opinions and whatever it may be, whatever you can fathom about God and about the gospel and about what His will is. You don't have to be a scholar to understand it. Whenever we consider who the apostles were, the ones who were given the task to go and spread Jesus' word throughout the world and see to it that everyone hears what it was that Jesus had taught, the majority of them were uneducated men. They were fishermen of low status, people who most likely would not have been ha- given the education that they would, some would claim that they need. But yet they were able to understand. They were able to teach. They were able to preach. They were able to grow for their own benefit. So God, why are you punishing me? Why are you correcting me? Why are you bringing me down? Because he loves me. Because he cares for me. Because he must be held in reverence and respect because he mentors me and he has given me everything I need to improve and is all for my benefit and he is the one who can help me grow he even gives us very easy lists to follow two of my favorite books for daily life as a Christian we have 1st John 1st John is really good at explaining what the character of a Christian is like we have 1st John chapter 1 that talks about do not walk in darkness. Do not love the world. Chapter 3, love your brother. Chapter 4, obedience by faith. And chapter 5, remaining pure from sin. All of that right there is what a Christian is supposed to be. You want to look at someone and be able to understand the way they live their life. If they truly follow God, it's right there. Whenever they see darkness, they have no fellowship with it. They go the other way. They have no love of the world. The things that are going on right now within politics or, or, or whatever you name it, whatever it is, if it goes against God, there is no love for it. We are to love our brother. The Christian that follows God loves his brother and cares for his brother. Whenever we talk about that word love, it's so easily and so often given the idea that where you just tolerate that no matter what your decision is, I I love you, so you do you. You live your best life. You go down whatever road you see fit. That's not what the biblical example of love is. Whenever God loves us, he tells us, stop it. Quit acting up. You're going down this road that is not going to lead to anything good. You need to make a change. The Christian who follows God and is obedient whenever God corrects him is one that loves his brother and that will have the courage to go to his brother and say, I love you, but you need to cut it out. I love you, but you're going down a road that's leading to nowhere. Just as that father with that child again, I love you, I care for you, I want to give you everything you need, but you have to stop what you're doing. 
as I heard once growing up, stop learning things the hard way. You have to break out of this mindset because it is not going anywhere for you. We have to remain pure from sin and be obedient. Whenever I do fall short, whenever I do sin, I am obedient that I will come back. That if I've wronged a brother, I come to them and say, I, I, I've, I've wronged you, I've sinned against you, please forgive me. That I go to God in prayer and say, God, please have mercy on me for what I've done. Please give me another chance. Please allow me to be in fellowship and unity with you once again. And then move forward in abstaining and remaining pure from sin. We have James as well that talks about the everyday life of a Christian. James chapter 1 talking about being a doer of the word and not hearers only. That it's not coming in one ear and going throughout the other, but you actually make application as to what it means to be a Christian. James chapter 2, that faith without works is dead, that I can have all the works and I can do everything right, but if I, have the, if I don't have the faith, if I'm doing it for the wrong reasons, that it's dead, but also that if I have faith that I, I'm fully convinced in who Jesus is, I'm fully convinced in what God has done, I'm fully convinced in everything that he's, he says, and I do believe, but yet I do nothing, faith is dead. We have James chapter 3, having control over the tongue, again abstaining from sin. It talks about in the very few verse, first verses of James chapter 3 how small a fire can create a giant blaze that burns down a forest. Once I had the experience of going to a brother's ranch, they're no longer here with us, they moved away, but went to their ranch and we're burning brush out of the driveway. And yet one small fire was not put out. In the span of over a couple hours, multiple acres of land were burned, were completely just wiped out. That is devastating to see. If I'm not controlling my tongue and being careful with the things I say, I can very easily cause that much damage. And it may even be something that I cannot repair and that will always cause a divide between my brethren who I love. James chapter 4, be humble in all things. I am not the one who is in control. I am not the one who knows all. I am not the one who will give you exactly what it means. I'm not the one who will tell you right from wrong and be correct 100% of the time. I am just as susceptible to falling and failing. That I understand my place, that there is someone higher than me, that is smarter than me, that is stronger than me, that has created the entire universe in the span of a week, that all he had to say was, let there be light. That he crafted the entire universe to a very fine degree. So much so that the earth itself, if it was just a few degrees further away from the sun, it would be inhabitable. But if it was just a few degrees closer, everything would be consumed and burned up. The entire universe is so finely tuned. I'm in the service of something greater and of someone greater. And he is the one who corrects me. He is the one who is punishing me at times. And I have to be willing to accept that. And I have to be willing to learn from that. James chapter 5 as well. Be patient and long-suffering. There are times where we feel like it's never going to end. This hardship that's going on whether it's of our own actions, our own decisions, or something else outside of what we have done. It's just hitting us hard. We have to be patient. We have to be long-suffering. But it may also be that we're trying to reach out to a brother. And sometimes that can be very irritating. Sometimes that can be very frustrating to get them to understand that God wants you to come back. We have to be patient. We have to be long-suffering. We have to be willing to wait sometimes. 
God, why are you correcting me? God, why are you showing me all this? God, why is all this difficult thing is happening in my life that maybe it, you are punishing me for, or maybe it's things outside my control? Why is all this happening? So that you can be perfected, that you can be a doer and not just one who says he believes, that you have faith and that you actually work out your faith, that you have control, self-control, that you are humble, that you understand who you, who you are, and who you're supposed to be, and that you'll be patient for the time whenever God comes again, and we can finally have judgment and peace. But he also corrects us because he wants us to stand on our own. None of us are able to stay at home forever. None of us are able to wean off the mother and father forever. We have to have the ability and the strength to stand up and be able to take care of ourselves at times. God is always there to help us. God is always there to push us in the right direction whenever we need it. But we have to be willing to take a stand. I've had the great blessing of having a nephew born recently. And it is amazing to see him grow. It's amazing to see the way in which my sister and brother-in-law handle him. That right now he is in the stages where he needs nurturing. He needs care. He is unable to stand on his own two feet. And he's in the very beginning stages of growing into the person he's supposed to be. And while he's not at the age where he can fully understand what's going on, they're already trying to set up an idea of what he's supposed to be, of where he's growing. That they both have an expectation that one day he is going to be the godly man that God would have him to be that he would be the righteous man that God would want him to be. It's amazing to see, but it's the exact same way for us, that we are all at one point that little babe that had nothing, that wasn't able to take care of ourselves, but God has nurtured us and taken care of us and expects us to grow and be mature. In Hebrews chapter 5, looking in verses 12, beginning of verse 12, Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter, tw- chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Sometimes whenever we think about those principles and those elementary principles, it's very easy for us to get caught up in that and want to settle there because it is comfortable for us that God you're giving me everything you need you're you're nurturing me you're you're caring for me you're providing for me so I, I want to stay right here I want to stay in this comfort zone it's uncomfortable to get out of it, it it's difficult to get out of it but we have to be able to Because God expects us to not be babes who need only milk, but solid meat. When it brought up Chris Emerson Emerson a few minutes ago, and whenever he was talking about the stages of spiritual growth, that you, you are cared for, you are nurtured, you are given everything you need, but you eventually have to grow into that person that I'm taking care of myself, I'm providing for myself, and I'm able to provide for others. God expects me to grow. Whenever we talk about standing on our own two feet, it means being able to understand where the pitfalls are and to not fall short of grace. Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. One last time we'll read the first few verses that were read for us earlier. Chapter 12 of Hebrews.
picking up in verse 12 and reading through verse 15. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Those end verses 14 and 15 Pursue peace with all people in holiness. Verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Not only those around you, but you yourself, making sure you don't fall short. We have other scriptures as well. Look in Titus with me. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. All of those things are the ways in which we don't fall short of grace. By denying ungodliness, by giving up the passions of the world, by living soberly, righteously, and godly. Verse 13, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself before us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So how do I make sure I don't fall short of grace? By actually performing good works. That, yes, I am leaving behind the person that I once was, and that whenever God corrects me, I do move forward and let go of the person I once was, but I look forward. I'm looking ahead. I'm looking to the end goal. I'm pursuing and zealous for good works that God has given to me. We do have to take care of others as well, as was brought up in verse 15 of Hebrews chapter 12. And looking in Titus chapter 2 and verse 15, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Sometimes we are going to have to rebuke that brother. That God has corrected me, God has shown me the way in which I'm supposed to live my life. Now I'm standing on my own, and though I may at times fall short, I get back up, I look forward, I move ahead, zealous for good works, but I also take care of my brothers because they're right there next to me. That whenever me and Jaden are growing up together, she may see that I'm not going the right way, that I'm not living my life the way I should, that maybe it is something innocent whenever we're young, something small. Or maybe we're at the ages now where it may be something more severe. And it may be that she goes to our parents and tells them, I I don't know what to do. He's going down this road, and I need your help to take care of him, to move forward. Or she comes to me on her own and says, look, I love you, but you need to stop. The way in which you're going throughout your life is going to lead nowhere. That's also from a place of humility. That God has corrected me, but he's also wanting me to make sure that you are not falling short as well. That he wants you to move forward and come back to him as well. We have to be willing to do that. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 talks about how we are to restore such a one who is falling behind and falling to the wayside. We have Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 through 17 that specifically state how we are to treat a brother who has sinned. And the most important thing is making sure that we do it all from a place of love, just as God does. That, brother, I love you, but these are the expectations that are set for us. So, God, why are you correcting me? God, why are you punishing me? It's because he loves me, because he's trying to mentor me in the way I'm I'm to be so that I can be successful throughout my spiritual life. And so that one day I can stand on my own and that even though I do look to him from time to time and I look to him for what it means to be strong and be the man he wants me to be, I'm also able to take care of others as well. That's why God corrects us. So the question I want to leave with you tonight is will you make a change? There may be some here tonight who have not been living the way that they should. They may not have been willing to submit to God to understand what it is that God wants you to do. 
There may be some who have at one point obeyed the gospel and decided to follow Christ, but have since let that go and given up on what it means, and has decided that, God, I know what's best for me instead of you. If you've made those decisions, tonight is the chance to make that right. If there's any need, why don't you please come forward to stand. We're singing.